So just uh, very quickly, I'm uh, uh, Gennady Schmetz from Applied Physics uh, with Greg. We are co-directing the photonic hierarchy of Marsec, as uh, uh, Frank already mentioned this. So uh, uh, I'm going to very briefly introduce our next uh, uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Alexandra Boscovich uh, uh, from Cornic uh, uh, Corporation. Uh, she is presently uh, a research director for optic services and integration technologies at Corning, and she is responsible for oversight of research programs and the several business groups within Corning. And uh, she has a PhD from in physics from Imperial College, and I won't take any more of your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to have come to spend this day uh, here at Cornell. I think the talks that I've heard so far were very impressive and um, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to make you excited about some of the topics that we are looking at in optics research at Cornell. So I've titled my, <coughs> I've titled my talk Optics Research in a Glass Company because Corning is uh, most of the time well known for being a materials company. And uh, sometimes people are surprised about the, the variety and breadth of topics that we research in, in optics at Corning. So I'm going to try to explain a little bit about how come we do so much optics at Corning, and also what does uh, research in an industrial setting looks like. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> okay. Um, glass, glass uh, Corning is a materials company that focuses on glass, and glass is really a very, very uh, technical and flexible, uh, versatile material. If you think about it, um, glass has been present in many key innovations throughout our history, uh, dating uh, very far back in our history. Um, you can think, for example, in the 13th century, uh, glass was used to invent spectacles, right? Which many of you here in the room are wearing, right? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> what did that enable, right? Uh, what it enabled was actually the ability of monks to be able to read and uh, copy manuscripts for longer hours, and that together with the invention later of the printing press uh, made us a society that reads and made reading popular. Another thing that I'm very sure that all of you in the room spend a lot of time doing, right? You fast forward maybe a, a century later, the 14th century, the invention of crown glass allowed people to make glass windows for their homes, for buildings, for churches, and that by itself may sound like a small thing, but it allowed us to control the climate of our indoor environment. A little bit further in time, 17th century, the invention of the telescope, which is basically about optical lenses, glass lenses, allowed us to look deeper into the sky and advance the field of astronomy. So glass is really this transformative material that is part of our everyday light, life in a way that sometimes we don't even think about what it means from a technology perspective. More recently, maybe in the lifespan of about maybe half of this room here, certainly in my lifespan, uh, glass made low loss optical fiber is possible. And that invention has transformed the way we think about telecommunications. Okay. <clears throat> so how come glass is such a, such a versatile material and how come we can do so many different things with the same simple material, right? Because after all, it's just sand. So how come? Well, the thing here is that you can add pretty much, you have the whole periodic table at your disposal to mix with that simple set of initial materials to transform the properties of glass. And knowing how to control that science and that art 
is really what gives you the ability to move from the most basic glasses to glasses that can be highly technical materials that are going to fuel the kind of inventions that we think we are going to have in the future. Okay? So about <clears throat> beginning of uh, 2011, uh, 2012, Corning came out with a series of uh, videos that talked about our vision for the future called A Day Made of Glass. And I'm going to show a very short one for you now about our most recent vision of how glass plays and will continue to play into the future on, in our lives. Now what I want you to pay attention is start to kind of look at how many of those apl applications have an optics component to it. Welcome to the Glass Age, a time of shattered preconceptions and finding new limits, when what was fragile becomes stronger than steel, what was brittle could be rolled up like paper, and billions of minds spin the globe in thin strands of light. This is the Glass Age where clarity creates a ritual world. The frame brings us closer to family. The display expands the mind. And the lens carries us to the heavens. This is the glass age, when engineers cover our eyes with new ways to see. Architects build walls that open possibility. Artists use fire to capture the sun, and material scientists invent powerful solutions to impossible problems. Yes, this is the glass age, but it's only just begun. Its potential is barely tapped. Now we must look deeper, reach further, to see how glass's strength and beauty can show us the vastness of our own. The glass age is here. Come along. Join us. So we may call it the glass age, but when I look at that, I see the optics age as well, because pretty much everything in there had some optical component to it. Okay. So what do you do about that in Corning? So part of uh, being, uh, you know, I think a lot of times uh, when I talk with people in academia, uh, there is a sense that industry doesn't necessarily prioritize uh, research in the same sense. In Corning, for us, it's part of our everyday life. It's actually seen as our key business advantage. It's to be able to solve problems that other people can't solve. And we can only do that if we understand the fundamentals of our materials, our processes, and how they are used. So because of that, we have a high level of investment in uh, R&D in Corning. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a significant, you know, there are very few companies in the U.S. or actually worldwide that can say they invest that much of their sales back into R&D. And the other part that is interesting about that is that of that uh, investment in R&D, about 80% of that is used to come up with new, better products for our existing businesses. The other 20%, it's used to do research in areas that we do not have a business today. So those are topics that uh, may generate a new business or uh, the topics that are about uh, building our competencies and our fundamental understanding in areas that we see are critical to us. So basically what we call exploratory research. <coughs> Today in Corning we have five main business sectors. One of them is display technologies where we make high quality optical glass for display panels. Uh, the other one is, um, I'm sorry, uh, optical communications, where now, not only we make optical fiber, which uh, we are well known for, but we also make 
optical cables, connectors and connectization solutions, and indoor wireless systems. Environmental technologies, where we make ceramic substrates that are used to make catalytic converters that in turn are used in vehicles to control the or to control the level of emissions for cars, trucks, and off-road uh, uh, vehicles. Life sciences. Now, life sciences is an interesting business. Uh, in, that's a business where we make uh, just um, labware for the healthcare industry. And in fact, we've been in that business since 1915 with Pyrex glass, which is a corny invention. But of course, today we do more than just Pyrex glass. Uh, we also sell uh, labware for cell culture products and genomics as well. Finally, uh, specialty materials, which is a segment that serves our consumer electronics business, uh, semiconductor aerospace businesses. Okay, so it's a very diversified uh, set of products and industries that we participate in there. Examples of products that we sell through that business are, for example, Gorilla Glass, which I'm pretty sure you guys have heard of, uh, but also uh, laser technologies and also biomedical imaging equipment. We also have a, a kind of a business incubator in Corning. So we invest into making new businesses, inventing new businesses for Corning. And in order to transform those technology innovations that have the potential to become a new business, to transform them into an actual business, we have to have a group in Corning that will help us with the commercial aspect of that. And that's our Emerging Innovations group. So now let's talk a little bit more about the technology and the history of technology in Corning. This here is a very abbreviated uh, timeline of innovations uh, that came from Corning that you may not be familiar with. Of course, the full list is a lot richer than that, but those are a few key examples in there. And I think one thing that is interesting to notice is that our first innovations go as far back as the second half of the 1800s. Right? So this is a very, very um, rich history of innovation. I want to tell you more about a few of those innovations. <clears throat> First, um, I have to start with optical fiber. And there is a, an interesting story in there. Right? So actually, uh, the method that we use to make the blanks for making optical fiber, which is a very controlled, high purity silica glass, right? Um, that method, the vapor phase deposition method, was invented in Corning in 1942, okay? Uh, the general method was invented by Corning in 1942 for a different, completely different purpose that didn't pan out. Okay. This method today is used on uh, variations on, of this method because the original patent is already expired. But variations of that method are used by Corning to make fiber today, by our competitors to make fiber today, other industries to make materials using that type of process. Okay. So we shelved that, that invention and we didn't really have anything to do with it. You fast forward a couple of uh, decades, and uh, uh, Dr. Tao, for what became later British Telecom, came up with the idea that if we had a fine optical fiber with a loss of less than 20 dBs per kilometer, that could revolutionize communications and we could initiate this era of optical communications. Now, the climbing scientists when they heard that, they knew what to do because they had this process that they had shelved, that they knew exactly how to control the purity of the glass and that they could pull, pull out the, the notebooks and the records that we had and adapt that process, not exactly in the same way, but adapt that process to make a really controlled quality glass blank and controlled also 
the kind of intuity that you wanted to put in it to generate the refractive index profile that you wanted to have to make that optical fiber. The first one we made, 17 dBs per kilometer. And after that, many improvements have been made to have the telecom grade fibers that we have today. Okay. This is a story, I could tell exactly the same story about several processes in Corning, okay? Um, I won't go into many details, but it's the same story for Gorilla Glass, okay? This is a, uh, the process of iron exchange was invented at Corning for automotive in-shield applications uh, considerably before when we were asked by one of our customers if we had a way to make a display glass that covers consumer electronics is stronger and break, break less often when people drop their phones. Again, we repurposed something we had done a long time before to meet that need. Now, the only reason we can re repurpose those inventions and we can quickly pull something off the shelf and re we told it for a different need is because there is a lot of fundamental understanding that is put into those pro pro processes. It's not just a mere, mere kind of engineering action of doing something that you don't fully understand. You have to have all the fundamentals together if you truly want to control your process and be able to modify it. Um, a more recently a uh, recent uh, innovation that we have is wheel glass, okay? This is a glass that is made with uh, the same process that we use to make display glass. Uh, so it's highly controlled glass, and yes, you see it move there and turn and all of that, and it is glass. Um, but it's so thin, it's 100 to 200 microns thick. But now you can treat it like a treat optical fiber. It's the same reason why you can bend optical fiber, because it's so thin. And I can make spools of glass sheets that can be used on, for example, row-to-row -row processing. Normally, row-to-row -row processing is done with uh, plastic polymer materials, uh, which work, but have a much higher coefficient of thermal expansion than glass. And therefore, if I can do that with glass now, I can achieve, for example, much higher ranges of temperature of processing, much greater alignment than what I could have done with a polymer. So these are some of the current things that we have at Corning for products, right? Now I'd like to uh, change gears and talk about some of the future opportunities that we are working on in research at Corning. Okay. So, First, in keeping with the theme of the day, yes, we work on quantum communications as well. Okay. Um, and why? Because it's a problem. There is a marriage between a materials problem and an optics problem. And therefore, we feel like we have something to offer on that space. <coughs> so, you know, quantum communications, uh, when, we when I think about it, right? Why do we need it, right? Uh, well, we need it because encryption is really important and has been with us for a very long time. Since, since Second World War II, when uh, the Enigma machine was used by the Germans to encode the information, keep secrets from allied forces, and the battle to break that code, well, you know, we've continued doing that throughout the years. Better, more sophisticated keys or encryption algorithms are created, more sophisticated ways of decrypting those keys get uh, put in place, and so we go, right? So nowadays, uh, we have uh, algorithms that are based on factorial, and with very large numbers, we could say that those keys could not be broken with a classical computer, but if we can imagine that maybe one day, I understand not in laptop format, but uh, one day we can get a quantum computer, you would be able to break those keys, and therefore we need quantum keys. And I've, I've been asked to do we really need uh, that level of protection in our lives. And I say, well, we actually, you know, we do. 
because look at this, you know, this here is a photo of the Pope's inauguration in the Vatican. Okay, the crowd was watching the, the Pope inauguration in the Vatican in 2005 and 2013. It's not even 10 years of difference, right? 2005, we got people with the cam card, as I'm pretty sure most of them are not even digital, okay? Um, you fast forward to 2013, everybody has a smartphone on their hands, okay? So our lives, you know, are completely out there, you know? Your bank information, your credit card information, your shopping habits, your health information, your vacations, the Pope, you know, everybody, everything is out there in digital format, in the internet. So yes, we do need good encryption, right? We don't want people to just have access to that information. So, what are we doing uh, for quantum communications in Kwani? Number one, well, we are famous for fiber, right? So we can help there. We can make fibers that will help those quantum keys be transmitted over longer distances. On the other hand, we also feel that we can play also on the quantum repeaters by working on better materials for quantum memories, okay? So let's talk about the distribution first. And I had some examples there of papers, recent papers that we had on that area. And uh, one thing, I'm gonna have to leave very shortly after my talk. I'm very sorry about that, that I want to be here to be able to talk to all of you. But we do have several people from Corning, especially Dr. Dan Nolan, Dr. Siavash Yazdonfa, and Dr. Paolo Dainesi over there who can cover everything that we are doing in our tech set coining. So if you want to talk to them afterwards, please do. Okay? In, in this area, we do a lot of external collaboration. We do not do everything ourselves because we are not in the business of actually generating the keys, detecting the keys, the schemes for, for the transmitter and the receiver. We don't do that. So we collaborate with others that do that part. For us, what we are doing is working on the transmission side. And uh, on the previous page, you, we had a record in there of 400 kilometers of transmission for, uh, for a quantum key. Here, over just single mode uh, fiber. Here, uh, what we are showing is not only uh, long transmission, shorter in this case, I think it's about 200 kilometers in this case, but at a higher bit rate. It's important to be able to transmit these keys at a higher bit rate. In this key, case here, the transmission uh, rate of the key is about 1.5 gigabits per second. And we are doing that not only controlling the loss, loss is important, but again, if you are trying to go to a higher bit rate, you have to control the dispersion as well. And we have a dispersion compensated fiber designed for this special purpose that is part of the transmitter that we have in there. And that's why you can get this uh, record-breaking combination of distance and bit rate in there. On quantum memories. Okay. So on quantum memories, what you're trying to do is, uh, people have worked on this, and there have been demonstrations of materials where you have single crystalline materials with atoms implanted into it that are sparse without interaction so that you can get those narrow line widths and have the material preserve the quantum state of the photon that is being absorbed. However, those materials can pose some challenges in manufacturing and uh, just from a practical perspective to have a practical material. So what we have been looking at coining is where, for example, can we make a ceramic material that much, may be much more friendlier to a manufacturing process and is still maintain those uh, narrow line widths because you're utilizing just the domains that are crystalline inside, inside of that ceramic material. 
So here's a result that we have uh, for erbium atoms uh, doped into uh, yttrium oxide ceramic. And uh, the line widths that we uh, were able to demonstrate here for this material are just a little bit broader than what you usually get for urban atoms doped into a crystalline matrix. We also were able to demonstrate very good transparency, 80% transparency of this material. In parallel, we are interested on calcogenide, fi uh, calcogenide glass fibers. And again, these materials are interesting because they have low Fermat energy and could be a good quantum memory because of that. But they have the advantage of being able to be drawn into a fiber format. And if you can do that, then it would be a much more convenient form factor for telecommunication types of applications, right? I'm going to actually skip this one. We work on uh, light guide plates uh, for LCD screens, uh, but I'm going to skip this topic. Uh, and the interesting thing in there is that we are uh, playing with nano replication to uh, change uh, how the light gets scattered on those uh, light guide plates, but we are running out of time. Laser processing. So we are very interested in laser processing at Corning. Now most people, when they think about laser processing, they think about cutting metal. And uh, that's not what we do at Corning. We use those lasers to modify and sometimes cut uh, glass materials. Here are some examples uh, of what we can do with a laser in glass. Um, of course, you know, if you look at your cell phone, you know, that, that may be uh, a, a piece of high-tech glass, but it also has to have holes cut in it so that you can get your microphone and buttons through uh, edges. This has to be separated from a bigger piece of glass, right? Edges have to be uh, treated in a way so that they don't become a source of uh, flaws and make your screen weak again. And we can use lasers to do that, right? So today we sell laser systems, right, that are able to cut glass uh, for the consumer electronics industry. We also use lasers to drill holes in glass. Glass can be a very interesting material as an interposer for the electronics industry. But in order to do that, you have to have vias going through that glass. And then later you have to metallize. There are other problems too, but from an optics perspective, um, we have to be able to drill those holes and they have to have certain aspect ratios, certain quality of surface, so that I can continue to process that piece of glass. So there are many, many reasons why I'm interested on this topic. Now, this is a good example of the type of research that we have to do in the industry to be able to come up with products like that. Because the truth is that today, nobody quite understands exactly what happens when a femtosecond, high energy femtosecond pulse of light travels through the glass. I can take SEM images that show me what is it that the aftermath. And these here, for example, I'm picking three different types of glass that the laser pulse is exactly the same. The result that I get is completely different, okay? So how am I going to control my process? How am I going to design a process if I don't have a full understanding of what's causing those differences? Right. And this process is not a simple one. This is something that was published about 10 years ago. It's not a paper by Corning, it's by another group. But it gives a potential explanation of the sequence of events that it's happen, happening during and after the pulse has gone through the glass. And as you can see, it's not simple. There's a lot of stuff happening there. And each of those uh, different uh, uh, processes is going to have an impact on the final condition of the glass. So 
the time scales are challenging here because trying to understand this or uh, be able to come up with measurement techniques that can look at what's happening on those time scales are not easy, uh, but it's part of what we are trying to do. We also work not just at trying to understand uh, the kind of temporal evolution and interaction with the glass, but also manipulating the beams so that I can have different beam uh, shapes interacting with the glass. That's at a very simple level, if I have just a Gaussian beam and I focus it in my glass, I get a point that the glass gets heated at which is not particularly convenient if I'm trying to cut the glass, for example, or drill a hole. Instead, if you use, for example, basal optics, I can elongate that focal distance and create almost like a cutting filament that can go through the glass. There are other ways of doing that, and we explore all these different approaches of how, how can I manipulate light to get the result that I want. Okay? Um, in terms of the kind of work that we are doing uh, in that area, right, so the goal is to understand all those complex interactions and the cascade of events. And we use tools like, for example, molecular dynamic simulation. That's one thing that I wanted to point out. Uh, uh, I don't know who was asking the question about the comparison of the modeling with the experiment, but that's something, that's our everyday life in coining. You cannot do uh, efficient research without good modeling tools. So, especially if you want to be fast, if you want to be first to market, and if you want to do it in a cost-effective way, you have to use simulation together with your experiments. And this here is no different. So we have we try to develop, we develop sometimes our own simulation tools because they are not always already available. They are informed by the experiments. They get validated against the experiments and then we use them to kind of optimize our parameter space. We are also doing kind of uh, pump and probe imaging to see uh, the plasma formation at the kind of uh, femtosecond, picosecond scale inside uh, the the glass. And of course we use uh, just uh, imaging techniques to see the aftermath like we saw on the first slide. So hopefully uh, this gives you an idea of all the things that we are doing in corning around optics. It's really, it's, I didn't even scratch the surface here. There is a very broad range of uh, activities in optics. It is intimately related to the glass and ceramic materials that we work on, and I think it will be with us for many years. Thank you. Okay, questions please. Yes? Uh, so Yes, we make CO2 laser systems and we sell them. Uh, we know how to use them to cut glass ourselves, but we prefer to sell them to our customers and educate them on how to use those uh, lasers and the process that they have to use to cut the glass that we also provide. Do you make pulsed CO2 systems? Yep. Yes. Kind of very best, so I couldn't imagine that you know I will leave today when Corning will be talking about quantum communication. <laughs> <laughs> I get that reaction a lot. <laughs> but uh, so uh, can you maybe elaborate a little bit? So what's special about this fiber that you guys are using for this? I'll let Dan answer that one. Are you talking about the transmission fiber or the calcogenide fiber? Well, kind of both. Do you want to answer them? Uh, okay, well, we do two things. We work on quantum memories and then transmission fibers. So the transmission fibers are very low loss and low dispersion because the pulses that we send through the, through the fibers kind of draw through the wavelength and um, put their narrow, and then they can mess with the um, speed at which you can send the pulse. So what's the loss? What's the uh, about 0.15. 
Yeah. So in that sense, those fibers, they are not that different from telecom fibers, right? They may be slightly modified for this exactly ap exact application, but still you're playing on that traditional space of playing with the loss and playing with the dispersion of the fiber, okay? Okay, well, if there are no more questions, Steph, let's uh, thank Alexander. Thank again. you.